Welcome to the Veritas Forum, engaging university students and faculty in discussions about life's hardest questions and the relevance of Jesus Christ to all of life. Uh, it's a pleasure to be with you uh, tonight. Well done to uh, and thank you to all of the sponsors, particularly the physics students. Um, uh, I want to talk about monopolizing knowledge. That's the title of my book. But the, the, the subtitle here is, Does Science Explain Everything? You might not have heard this expression, scientism, before. Uh, what is scientism, you might say? Well, scientism, in short, is the belief that science is all the real knowledge there is. And the reason why I focus on this uh, question of scientism is that I believe that scientism, which is a very widespread opinion in our society today, is at the heart of many of the misunderstandings that can exist between science and religious faith. And the point of my book is to look at scientism, to examine it, um, to, to uh, examine to what extent it is justified, uh, to draw distinction between scientism and science itself, and uh, to look at the cultural co consequences of scientism. Um, but you might say, well, does anyone actually believe that? Does anyone really believe that science is all the real knowledge there is? Well, actually, yes, a lot of people do. Now, a lot of people don't explicitly declare this belief or espouse this belief, but I want to give you some examples of, of relatively explicit scientism at work in modern writings. If you take a, a writer like Richard Dawkins in his book, The God Delusion, on about five or six different places in this book, he says things like, the existence of God is a scientific hypothesis like any other. And so he's implicitly adopting a view that science um, is competent to answer all questions. Or Paul Thagard, in his book, The Brain and the Meaning of Life, he says, what is reality? Those things and processes identified by well-established fields of science using theories backed by evidence drawn from observations and experiments. So he's pointing to science and he's saying, what is reality? Reality is what science discovers. Um, the most explicit example of scientism I found recently is in a book by Alex Rosenberg. Here he is. He's a uh, Duke University philosopher. He's written this book called The Atheist's Guide to Reality. He, he says he's all in favor of, and, and he believes in scientism, and he defines it as in essentially the same way that I do. And, he, and then he says, science provides all the significant truths about reality. And in case you didn't quite get it, he then goes on to say, once you adopt science, you'll also be able to, treat, to, to cease treating the humanities as knowledge. Okay, so that's pretty clear cut, okay? But the truth of the matter is, scientism is very rarely as explicit as this. It's much more of a kind of default background philosophical view uh, that kind of pervades particularly the university, but also our society as a whole. What I want to talk about today is going to come in about in three parts, roughly speaking. First of all, I want to talk about what science is. Um, what, is, what are its methods and its competence. Secondly, I want to explore what scientism is and, and, and how it is, in a certain sense, a distortion of science into what effectively becomes a religious worldview. And then I want to draw some contrasts between Christianity and secular scientism. So, first of all, what do we mean by science? One reason for misunderstanding this question of science and scientism is to do with the meaning of the word science. And if you look to the Latin derivation of the word science, which comes from scientia, scientia just means knowledge. And once, um, long, long ago, the word science simply meant um, any systematic system of knowledge. Um, so if you were to read, for example, um, the Encyclopedia, Encyclopedie 
of Denis Diderot and, and Pierre Laplace, which is one of the sort of characteristic documents of the French Enlightenment, um, you'll find that that is the way they uh, use the word science. It's, it's used to mean just any systematic knowledge. Moving 100 years later into the middle of uh, the 19th century, uh, an, an historian, someone like um, Lord Macaulay, would use the word science in essentially the same way. He'd, he'd refer to it as being the growth of the human mind. And even in the, 19, in the 20th century, uh, as late as the 1940s, um, R.G. Collingwood um, would also use that word, interestingly, in a book called An Essay on Metaphysics, which, whose whole aim was to try to expose what I would call scientism and, and to disavow it. He nevertheless uses the word science to mean any body of systematic or orderly thinking. Now, if this is what science means today, then I would say by this definition, scientism is not only true, it's a tautology. Because if science just means knowledge, then yes, of course, science is all the real knowledge there is. It's just by definition. But the problem is, that is not what we mean by science today. Um, what we mean when we use the word science unqualified is what would once have been called natural philosophy or natural science, the study of nature. It's the modern science that we've in inherited from the scientific revolution. And that's what I assert. That's what most people mean when they just refer to science. And it's certainly what I am going to mean today when I talk about the relationship between science and the Christian faith. Because if we talk about science and religion, we're not talking about reconciling, let us say, the latest economic theories uh, with Greek mythology. No, we're talking about the compatibility of Christianity or some major religion like that with a modern understanding of physics, chemistry, biology, geology, cosmology, and things like that. So science and faith, I would argue, is a burning issue in our society today, precisely because natural science, uh, what I mean by the word science, unqualified here, has enormous epistemological prestige. People believe what they're told by scientists. Um, and, and that's associated with an enormous trend in our society. And if science had its old-fashioned meaning uh, of, of just being contemplative systematic knowledge, then theology would still, I would assert, uh, be a science, even if perhaps today it would not be the queen of the sciences that it was often referred to in medieval and, and early modern times. But science doesn't mean that today. And I would argue that theology is not science in the same sense that I mean it. It's, in other words, theology is not a natural science. Now, what is science? Well, um, we better get a bit more specific about this. Many people would say, well, this is, pretty, this is more or less unproblematic. Um, science is just the study of nature. But calling science the study of nature, which it is, um, isn't actually terribly helpful. Because we d it's very far from clear, generally speaking, what we mean by nature. And the, and the ambiguity of the, of the word nature and, and that usage itself has been known for hundreds of years. This is Robert Boyle, of the famous Boyle's Law. He was one of the co-founders of the Royal Society in London. Um, and he um, wrote a whole book on the topic, a free inquiry into the vulgarly received notion of nature. And his whole um, purpose in writing that book was to point out the ambiguity of, this, of the meaning of the word nature. He cites eight different um, possible meanings of the word nature. And he was at pains to uh, try to uh, deprecate the meaning of nature, which referred to Aristotle's um, uh, explanations and Aristotle's science. And he was at pains to advocate uh, that what we ought to mean by nature is the settled course of things. So because this word nature is itself so uh, ill-defined, it's better to approach an understanding of what we mean by natural science um, through its methods, um, not um, 
through its topics. So what are the methods of science? I think we all pretty much know what the methods of science are. Um, it's, uh, has it, it, it depends on distinctive characteristics and strategies like observation, experiment, measurement, um, systematization, mathematics very often, self-consistency, universality, and so on. I think those kinds of characteristics can most usefully be summarized under two main headings, which I want to explain a bit more deep depth, but let me just uh, say what they are to begin with. First is reproducibility, that science depends upon repeatable experiments or observations. And secondly, science depends upon clarity, by which I mean unambiguous descriptions, which often involve measurement, classification, and mathematics. And the main point of what I want to say at this point is that these requirements, or these characteristics, imply a limitation in science's scope of action application. Now, let me try to explain a little bit more about these repeatability and clarity characters. This uh, is a woodcut of the lab in the Royal Institution of Michael Faraday. Michael Faraday was one of the most fascinating characters in Victorian science uh, in those heady days of the development of electricity and magnetism. Um, he uh, said that he had a tremendous imagination and that he could imagine the Arabian Nights as much as anything else. But he said that his imagination had to be uh, uh, corrected and corralled uh, by uh, the facts. He says, the facts were important to me and saved me. He said, without experiment, I am nothing. So Michael Faraday recognized the importance of experiment in science. And it was said of him that as, whenever he would hear about some new discovery uh, that someone had um, made in electricity or magnetism or early chemistry as, as Faraday was working on them, the first thing that Michael Faraday would do is he would go down to his own lab in the Royal Institution and he would try to reproduce those results because he knew in his bones that science depended upon reproducibility, that if someone did an experiment somewhere at some time, then he, M Michael Faraday, ought to be able to do it and repeat, and by repeating the, the um, conditions, get the same result. And so I like to think of this woodcut as representing Michael Faraday trying to repeat uh, the experiments that he'd heard about elsewhere. Did this insistence upon the facts, did this insistence upon reproducibility make Michael Faraday into an arch skeptic? No, far from it. He was a lifelong Christian. He belonged to a, a, a nonconformist uh, church called the Sandem Sandemanians. And actually, for extended periods of his adult life, he was an elder in that church, which for that church meant that he acted essentially the pastor, the preacher, and, and would visit the sick. Well, you might say, okay, Hutchinson, I, I can see how um, experimental science depends on reproducibility, but how about the stars? I mean, isn't astronomy a science? And we can't do experiments on the stars, so how can reproducibility be part of observational science? Well, to make a long story short, yes, it can, and yes, it is. Here is uh, a photograph of the Crab Nebula. There's a great story that goes with the Crab ne Nebula. In 1054, Chinese astronomers, uh, in, in uh, July, 4th of July, actually, wasn't uh, uh, our 4th of July, of course, um, observed a very bright new star in the sky. It grew in brightness so that it actually outshone the morning and evening star, and it persisted and then gradually faded away over some weeks and months. And that was a supernova. Now, um, if that supernova had been a one-of-a-kind observation never to be repeated, it would be rather puzzling to know what these people saw. But the fact of the matter is, 
Many other supernovae occur, and we now, with our um, telescopes that we now have, we can see supernovae on a regular basis taking place uh, in our galaxy and beyond. Any telescope can view it. What's more, this left observable traces that Crab Nebula is, in fact, the remains of that um, supernova that the Chinese astronomers observed. Anyone can go out to a halfway decent telescope and see the Crab Neb Nebula uh, for themselves. What's more, you can make repeatable observations on it. And those re repeatable ob observations have, can be very systematic. So a, an undergraduate student at Dartmouth College, uh, a, a group of them, made an analysis of photographs taken of the uh, Crab Nebula over some 10 years or so, and they saw that you could see that the Crab Nebula is actually still expanding from the explosion that took place. And if you trace back, if you take its velocity and trace it back to when it must have all been together in one place and ask when that was, the answer is um, mid-11th century, fully consistent with the history that we know about the Crab Nebula. So what's the point? The point is that reproducibility of observations is just as important as it is of experiments. Reproducibility doesn't just mean uh, reproducibility at will. Sometimes we have to take multiple examples that we aren't able to reproduce at will. But many, many things in our lives and in our world do not possess uh, that kind of reproducibility. History, I think, is the best example. Only a tiny fraction of the activities of hi an historian really benefit from an analysis that bears any relationship to the methods of natural science. For example, how do we know the truth of the statement that Julius Caesar was assassinated on the steps of the Roman Senate on the 15th of March in 44 BC? Not by the methods of science or anything like it. And yet we really do know that. That is true knowledge. History possesses real knowledge. It's just not scientific knowledge in the sense that I mean. And I could multiply examples. Economics. Um, I was living in England in uh, the time when Margaret Thatcher was the prime minister. And she brought in policies um, which were based upon the, the uh, teachings were of a certain economist that were Milton Friedman that were called monetarist policies. And the press in England in those days was fond of calling this the monetarist experiment. Now just think about this. Supposing you're an economist and you have a theory and you get the opportunity for your theory to be tried out on a whole country's economy. Now that's a pretty impressive experiment, okay? So, uh, so now, let's ask the question, what was the result of that experiment? Did it prove that Milton's three, uh, Friedman's theories were correct or not? And the answer is no. It didn't prove it either way. And the reason is because that experiment was not like a scientific experiment. It was not a reproducible experiment. It was a one-off uh, which could never be repeated in which the conditions could never be put, set back uh, to the beginning and tried over again. So economics is an extremely important discipline. It's a very rigorous discipline. There's, even, there's a lot of mathematics that goes into economics. I don't want to be misunderstood as running down economics, but it doesn't operate in the same way that natural sciences does. It, this was not an experiment in science. And the same goes for politics. Politics is enormously important in our society. Um, the uh, progress and, and uh, um, events of our world are governed by and large by it. And yet, politics is unfortunately not a science. And so to call it political science is using that word science in the old-fashioned way in a way which is very confusing, okay? Because it doesn't operate like science. These are not sciences. These are examples of disciplines which are not sciences. And even though my colleagues in these disciplines will sometimes bristle when I say these are not science, sciences, they shouldn't do. 
The reason they bristle is because they think when I'm saying these are not sciences, I'm running them down. I'm saying they don't have real knowledge. And the reason they, they think that is because they have tacitly um, given in to this opinion of scientism, that science is all the real knowledge there is. And so if someone says something isn't science, then if you believe in scientism, then, then you're saying that isn't real knowledge. But I don't believe in that. And so I'm not saying they aren't real knowledge. I'm saying they are real knowledge. And yet they are not science in any meaningful sense like the natural sciences. Let me talk about clarity. Clarity is, in a certain sense, the, the foundational uh, requirement for the expression of reproducibility. The results of a scientific experiment have to be able to be expressed in unambiguous terms. Otherwise, you can't tell whether you've got the same answer as somebody else somewhere else at some other time. And so um, this leads us very often in the sciences, this search and striving for clarity, to measurement. Measurement is a way of reducing the descriptions of nature into numbers and mathematics, which provide us with perhaps the most clear way of, in, of expressing um, our results. Uh, of course, the whole process of measurement isn't just mathematics. It depends on uh, other things. For example, units, extremely important. This is a photograph of one of the copies of the international kilogram. The kilogram, the, the unit of mass, is the only unit left in our SI system, in our in international system, uh, where the unit is defined in terms of an artifact, an object. The other units in our um, uh, physical s systems these days are defined in terms of phenomena, wavelengths or oscillations and speed of light and things like that. So, so measurement is not just mathematics. It's part, a very vital part of science. It's a way of getting clarity. But, but actually, it's, it, it's a mistake if you think of it purely, uh, this clarity, purely in terms of Mathematics. There's more to clarity than mathematics because if you think about, for example, the early stages of, of botany as a field, where uh, where people are going out into the in, into the jungles or into the into the byways and finding uh, samples of various uh, plants, um, there are enormous amounts of field skills which go into that, and those field skills are a, a vital part of the way in which that science maintains and preserves and develops is clarity. Or if you think about physiology, descriptions of bodies of animals or, or humans, that isn't really mathematics, and yet it does strive very hard for clarity. But many, many important things in our world and in our lives do not possess the kind of clarity that dem is demanded by science. So if you think, for example, about the beauty of a sunset, or the justice of a verdict, or the drama of a play, or the terror of a war, or the love of a woman, these are things which don't possess that kind of clarity. Now, I don't mean to say that you can't analyze some aspects of these, this by science. If you take the sunset, for example, you can have a perfectly good scientific description of why there is a gradation of color in the sky, that it comes from the scattering of the, the sunlight um, through uh, dust particles and, and, um, and air molecules and so on and so forth. You can talk about the fact that color is the wavelength of light. You can analyze it in terms of numbers um, of, uh, of the wavelength and so on and so forth. So you can have a perfectly good scientific description of a sunset. But when you have that scientific description, has that captured the, its beauty? I don't think so. It's, in fact, that scientific description m more likely has missed the point. Um, because all of these things uh, w which are referred to in, in topics like this are things which don't possess the kind of clarity uh, that science requires. I want to do a little demonstration about this question of clarity on the subject of music. I think music is a very good example of a topic which doesn't possess the kinds of clarity that science depends on. So ask yourself the question, um, what is this event? Let's see if I can get this to work.
Hmm. Well, that's disappointing. Right. That's extremely embarrassing. I think I've crashed my computer. Well, okay. I apologize for that. My Isn't it isn't it horrible when that happens? So, what I was trying to show you, and, and if, my, if my computer recovers, I will show you, um, is an, an example of music. I'm going to try it one more time. Well, I won't, I won't, I won't try to run the, the uh, music, so that's a disappointment. This is an event, so what happens, I'll just describe what happens. What happens is, this young lady in the middle crashes these two symbols together. The guy at the back, who appears to have a great big hammer, crashes it down onto an anvil. And this is all taking place in the context of a symphony. Okay, uh, This is Mahler's Sixth Symphony. So the question is, in that event, sorry, sorry about the demonstration breaking, um, what has happened? A scientific description of that event might say, okay, we have two circular disks of a mostly copper alloy that are brought sharply together, their edges interfere, um, sound waves are generated or uh, perturbations are generated in the electrons uh, at the surfaces of those, uh, uh, of those alloy um, elements. They transfer the momentum to the I, um, the atoms of the, and the molecules of the material, they propagate through the brass uh, and they couple to the air and they propagate out as sound waves. That's a perfectly good scientific description of that of the event that I, was, that I failed to play for you. Um, but of course it misses the point. The point is not the crashing of, of, of brass together. The point is that she's playing the cymbals. But it's not only that, so that's, what, that's, that's a true statement. The scientific description is true. She, it's also true that she's playing the cymbals. It's also true that she's part of a symphony orchestra, as is that guy at the back who's, who's going to hammer, hammer the anvil. So there's a bigger picture here. There's, they're part of a symphony orchestra. But even that's not the whole story. The story is they're playing a piece. They're playing a symphony by Mahler. Okay. But even that's not the whole story. There are people in this audience who are listening to this music, and this is perhaps the most significant thing, is that music's meanings um, are not even present in the scientific description itself in isolation. They are only elicited uh, in, in the interaction of the music with the listener themselves. So each listener has a context that they bring to the listening of, to that symphony uh, that is part of the meaning of that. And all of these things bring in enormous ambiguities. And so to make a long story short, the ambiguities are an important part of what's going on here. And ambiguity can't be expressed unambiguously. This is Jacques uh, Monod, who was a Nobel Prize winner, um, a biologist in the 1960s and 70s. And I want to introduce you to this quote by him. What he says is, the cornerstone of the scientific method is the postulate that nature is objective. In other words, the systematic denial that true knowledge can be got at by interpreting phenomena in terms of final causes that is to say, of purpose. Now, the reason I like this quote is, in the first place, this is an example of implicit scientism. So look carefully at what he says. The first sentence, he's talking about the scientific method. 
In the second sentence, he's talking about true knowledge. And he's identifying those two things. In other words, he's implicitly taking uh, the position that science is all the true knowledge there is, and that is scientism, with which I disagree. Okay? But the second reason I like this quote is that I think if you think of it not as a, a, a remark about all of knowledge, but just as a remark about scientific knowledge, I think there's a great deal of truth in it. It is, in fact, a correct characterization of science. Science does, in general, rule out final causes, in other words, purpose, as part of its operating postulate. Um, and um, it does so as, as part of this insistence upon um, reproducibility and clarity, which exclude free agency. And, um, and so modern natural science, in a certain sense, rules out explanations in terms of personality and purpose from the get-go. There can never, in a certain sense, be a scientific description of personality and purpose. We must look for those in non-scientific terms. Now, what I've been working up to is this question about scientism. There has been in the, in the academy in the last 30, 40 years or so, a tremendous reaction against scientism. And it's been spearheaded in large measure by a movement mostly in the humanities and arts called postmodernism. And postmodernism is many important things, and, and I'm sure you here, m many of you know more about postmodernism in its, in its phenomena uh, in the literature and, and uh, uh, so on than I do. But let me point out that one of the canonical writers of postmodernism, Jean-Francois Lyotard, says very clearly in his important book, scientific knowledge doesn't represent the totality of knowledge. It has always existed in addition to and in competition and conflict with another kind of knowledge, which I'll call narrative. Or he says in another place, knowledge is not the same thing as science. <laughs> so a big part, I assert, of what postmodernism modernism is reacting against is in fact scientism. Many academics in the non-scientific disciplines join in this rejection of scientism and I would argue they do so rightly. That it is in many ways a justified reaction to scientism's pretended monopoly of knowledge. The problem is that many people in this movement take this to extremes. And they end up rejecting not just scientism, but they reject science's own expertise in its own areas of the understanding of nature. And when they do that, they provoke the science wars, which are not as fierce as they once were, but I think they're still bubbling quietly in the background. Um, so what they're, what they're, the danger there is that postmodernism has a tendency to throw out the baby science with the bathwater scientism. But that's not really necessary provided you draw a distinction. So the problem, I, I would say, with much of the critiques that come out of postmodernism of science are that they're failing to distinguish between science and scientism. So now I want to move on and talk about scientism as essentially an unproven worldview. Scientism, I think, has um, a justifying narrative history. It has an integrating cosmology. It has an interpretive lens or filter, a way of looking at the world which colors one's understanding of it. You might be surprised to hear also that scientism has a community of believers and that those believers look to scientism as a source of ethics. Now, it won't have escaped your um, notice that these are the characteristics of a religion. Now, I've been talking a little bit about the integrating cosmology of um, of scientism, the way, the way that it thinks the world is made up. But let me just very quickly touch on some of these other phenomena. First of all, the justifying narrative history. 
This is Galileo, perhaps the most characteristic tale told in justification of scientism is the story of Galileo's confrontation with the Roman Inquisition. And it's portrayed in this, um, uh, this painting, uh, of which it, this is a photograph. Um, here is Galileo. Look at him very carefully. Look at his pose, his heroic pose. Okay? Um, if you look around his head, you see there's actually a, 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 some light that encloses his head. It's almost a halo. So he's actually a sainted hero, okay? Um, there are many other things about this painting that one could go into. If you look carefully at this painting, you, you see that it, it seems as though almost all of the light in this painting is coming from Galileo himself. He is what is illuminating the, um, the Roman Inquisition here. Um, this is a painting with a purpose. Uh, it's supposed to show uh, in, in its own way, uh, this story that has been promoted that science has always been at war with theology and with religion, um, that science has been held back by the, by the vested interests of religion, but eventually, by virtue of its heroes, has overcome and spread light and knowledge to all of humankind. Now, the interesting thing, though, about this painting is not so much the details of it, but the date. The date of this painting is 1857. <coughs> this is a painting of a view of Galileo's confrontation with the Roman church. The, not from the 1630s when this took place, but from more than 200 years later. And, and the significance of this date, the middle of the 19th century, is that that is when scientism really got going in the West. Uh, and it got going as part of an important strategic vision in the 19th century world, part of overthrowing religious control of universities and, and of the intellectual uh, resources of our societies. And the story of, of Galileo, as I you know, just po painted it in just a few sentences, was a, an important part of that justifying narrative of scientism's, um, uh, scientism as a tool in the secularization of universities. Let me say one or two things about the community of believers. In the er earlier in the 19th century, um, Auguste Comte um, was um, writing and teaching uh, his main uh, point was the law of three stages. He believed that all of human knowledge had to go through essentially three stages, um, starting at the, th the theological or fictitious and ending at the scientific or the positive. So this was a scientific vision that Comte and the other positivists, that's, um, that's what I'm referring to here, had, that true knowledge must eventually become scientific like the natural sciences. And Comte thought he was in the process of bringing this to pass for, for um, sociology. But the, but the thing I want to draw attention to is that Comte's positivism turned into an organized religion. It was called the religion of humanity, it had a hierarchical priesthood, public services of commemoration, daily prayers, um, it had nine different sac personal sacraments, and 81 annual festivals. So in fact, um, it had all the trappings of religion, um, not, not even leaving out churches. Here's a positivist temple uh, still standing in Brazil. This question of looking to the uh, worldview for ethical uh, guidance and meaning has been very much part of scientism's influence in our society. Um, perhaps the best known types of such uh, ethics are s various forms of social Darwinism. I won't say much about Herbert Spencer. He rose to um, fame very, very quickly, particularly in America, in part because he used um, 
uh, an understanding of, uh, of evolution, biological evolution, to try to argue for laissez-faire capitalism. He said that basically the, the kind of principles of evolution um, had to be left alone to work themselves out in the mo open market as well as they did in biology. Um, eugenics was a different movement. In fact, in a certain sense, it was an opposite movement. Eugenics said, no, it sh um, the evolution of society shouldn't, and, of, and of humanity shouldn't be left alone to follow its own course. We need to help it along. Um, and yet, um, even though it grew much more slowly, it acquired a, a amazingly wide um, support, never uncontroversial, but always controversial. And so here's a, a famous statement that I won't read out um, in support of, of, um, of eugenics, um, which I think most people would be shocked about today. But these sorts of, of, of statements came not just from you know, wild rednecks. This was a statement by a Supreme Court justice. Now, the civilized world recoiled in horror at the outcome of uh, what eugenics brought in terms of the Nazi Holocaust. Um, but, and, and that was, I think, a very good thing. But it wasn't so much longer, wasn't but a few decades later, that these types of attempts to derive morality scientifically uh, came back into popularity. So that, for example, E.O. Wilson, in his book, uh, particularly Sociobiology, which was essentially applying some of the um, uh, analogies of social insects to to humans, um, tried to bring back these kinds of arguments. He, um, Wilson, arrives actually at, at opposite conclusions to the eugenicists. He, he says we should allow diversity to flourish, okay? And that's, of course, in much, much more in, in uh, harmony with the way we think today than, than eugenics was. The problem is that it's no more logically following from uh, the observations about biology than eugenics was. Basically, the problem is that any, all of these arguments can be twisted to support practically anything that you want. Um, so they're not really a basis for a stable ethics. So scientism and Christianity, I'm going to say, in clear, as clearly as I can, are in fact incompatible. And the reason is that scientism, the belief that science is all the real knowledge there is, is in fact a rival worldview. Effectively, it's a kind of religious view. Um, but religion, or Christianity, is not the only thing that scientism is incompatible with. Scientism is incompatible with lots of other non-scientific disciplines. Um, and so it doesn't really bother me terribly much uh, as a Christian when I assert that scientism is incompatible with Christianity. I think that science and Christianity are not incompatible. And I think that if you distinguish science from scientism, then you're able to see the most important thing, which is that scientific and non-scientific descriptions can be simultaneously valid. In other words, as I, you can have a scientific description, let's say, of the symbols, but that one was crashing together, but that doesn't invalidate all the other higher level descriptions that I also gave you. And the same is true in many different areas. And by the way, this is not just a, uh, a reaction on the part of religious people who, who need to find a way to make sense of their religion in relationship to modern science. This is an attitude which has, which has always been there in religious viewpoints. If you read the Bible, um, it's full of a recognition that there can simultaneously be natural explanations of, of some events and also spirit, deeply spiritual meanings of those events. What's more, this is an attitude that is compatible with the advocacy of Christians over history. Many of the, of the, Christian, of the great um, scientists of history were Christians and they tended to advocate the view of so-called the two books view, that God has revealed himself through the book of his word, which is the Bible, and the book of his works, which is nature. And that those two books 
can both be read in order to discover um, something about God. And, and also, this attitude of scientific and non-scientific descriptions being simultaneously valid is, I would argue, philosophically necessary for any non-scientific dis discipline, regardless of religion. So let me um, draw things to a close by trying to contrast two worldviews or viewpoints. I think it's fair to say that um, the most widespread view in the secular university and secular society as a whole is that there is no reality beyond what is discovered by science and that there is no good or authority higher than the freedom of the individual. Now Christians um, would acknowledge that both uh, science and freedom are good. But we take a different view. We believe that both the deepest reality and the highest moral good or authority are to be found in loving relationships. We believe that this universe was created by a God whose nature is love expressed in relationships, and that humans find their truest fulfillment by entering in freely into a loving relationship with God and with one another. Now we look around us and we see that all is not love. There's a great deal of alienation, anger, strife, war, and pain. But Christians believe that God has entered into the experience of his, of his creatures in the person of a human, Jesus Christ, and has taken upon himself that alienation and pain and suffering, and at great cost, overcome it. And we believe that this event took place in history, in a small country in the Middle East, and that it reverberates up and down the centuries. Now, that is not a scientific cosmology, a scientific description of the significance of the world. But I believe it is not a description or a cosmology which is inconsistent with the scientific cosmology that many of us know very well. When the atheists argue that religion today is meaningless or irrational, what they often say is, you have no evidence for your belief in God. What they actually mean, I would say, is not that there is no evidence for God, but actually that there is no scientific evidence for God. Actually, there are some aspects of modern science which I think do uh, point towards or suggest a creator. Um, but perhaps it's true up to a point that there is no uh, direct scientific proof of God. But there are nevertheless important reasons to believe in God. Those reasons, by the way, are not all evidence. Evidence is not the only reason uh, that exists. There are many different types of reasons one might um, think about to believe in God. There are arguments, which are essentially philosophical uh, a priori arguments. There is evidence, that is um, uh, examination of the events of history and, uh, and of, of humanity, um, as well as of nature. Uh, there is uh, immediate individual experience. Many people believe in God because, they've ex uh, because of experiences they've had. Um, there is a sense um, of ordering coherence about the religious position. Um, and there is, in the end, just a question of utility. Maybe religion is simply good for me. Okay. Um, so these are all, I would submit, different types of reasons. Um, but just focusing on the one type of reason uh, that um, is often uh, adduced by the critics, 
The sorts of evidence one would expect for Christianity, or indeed for any religion, are, I would assert, not so much scientific evidence as they are historical or forensic. Because after all, God is mostly not a scientific question, so it should be no surprise if the evidence for God is mostly not scientific. But if science can't discover or can't decide, can't arbitrate um, whether or not Christianity is true, how does one discover whether Christianity is true? Well, let me leave you with just a few thoughts on that topic, and then I hope there'll be some excellent questions, um, both from the floor and from your tweets. Um, how do you discover whether Christianity is true? Well, I mean, I think you use your intelligence. You use the primary documents. Well, what are the primary documents? Well, mostly, the starting point, point at the very least, should be the New Testament. And how do we approach that? Well, I mean, part of being um, thoughtful in a, in a way of trying to discover the truth of something is not to bring so much baggage to the table that you've already decided the question. So presuppositions that we bring to the New Testament might be very important. If you come with uh, the presupposition that science is all the real knowledge there is, you're going to have a certain way of reading uh, the primary documents of Christianity um, that are in the end going to have brought in um, things like, oh, miracles don't happen, do they? Um, uh, and you'll have an attitude that will color the way you read those, those um, passages. I would say also, by the way, to you Christians out there, um, that, well, that works both ways. I mean, we who are Christians um, do think the Bible has important authority in matters of faith and, and life. But if I'm asking a non-Christian to come and read the Bible without bringing baggage, we also ought to, in, un, un, in some cases to come to the scriptures and be willing to say, we, won't have, we don't have to presume uh, that you know, the Bible is word for word perfect in order to make some sense of it. So I would say, if someone is interested in, in Christianity, you don't have to believe the Bible is perfectly true and inerrant in order to read the New Testament and get some benefit out of it. You might come to believe more about that question later, um, but you should not be expected to bring that as part of your presupposition. Focus on Jesus Christ. After all, Christianity is about him. Was he an historical figure? Um, are the main texts um, about him what was it, approximately what was originally written? Or are they so unreliable because of corruption over the centuries? Ask yourself those questions. Um, what sort of life was his? What were his teachings? They're rather extraordinary teachings focused on himself, as has been pointed by, out by a number of writers, for example, C.S. Lewis. Um, that has an important influence on, on how we can understand him. Did he, ultimately, the biggest question is, did he rise from the dead? That's what his followers said, and that was the most important message that they took out in that first century. Now think about those apostles. Think about those disciples. Um, how do we decide the truth of these questions? What is the evidence? That evidence will be there. There will be lots of different types of evidence. It will be circumstantial. It will be documentary. It'll be, there may even be some scientific evidence. There'll be logical uh, arguments. There'll be testimony and so forth. And I would say, ask yourself the question, if there were such a God and Savior engaged with his creation, uh, desiring a personal involvement with his creatures, how would you discover that? And I would argue that when you've been through all of these questions, these intellectual questions, which are important and, and worth addressing and, uh, and can be addressed in a reasonable way, you would still be at the point where you had to say the, the way that you would get to know God is to seek that relationship with him. And I would argue that that is the most important, certainly one of the most important, aspects of what 
Christians mean when they say that it's a matter of faith. Thank you very much. Over to you, Greg. Thank you, Ian. OK, well, now we have some time uh, for questions. Um, and uh, let me just make a brief announcement before uh, question time. I think most of you got one of these 60-second uh, survey cards as you came in. Uh, please take a minute and fill it out if you can. And um, we won't use it for any kind of spam, just an opportunity for you to have a chance at the iPad and also to find out your experience of tonight. <laughs> So I think we have some microphones that a couple of ushers are holding. And if um, some of you want to uh, raise your hand and uh, frame some questions, we'll go with that. I'm going to start with one of the questions that was sent to us electronically um, as in the lead up to the event. And then we'll start uh, taking questions from the floor. Actually, kind of uh, two questions that are essentially the same that I'll ask together. And that is, what, clarify, what classifies as an illegitimate way of knowing in terms of understanding the world if science is not the only means of legitimate knowing? What constitutes an illegitimate way of knowing? How do we, so is the question. person ask essentially what seems to me to be the same question. If science is not the only legitimate way of knowing, what criteria should be used oh, to discern okay. illegitimate ways of knowing? Well, I certainly think that we need to apply to all of our ways of understanding the world the usual criteria of logic and reason. Um, but I think that to regard reason as being something being something that only science possesses is, a, is, a, is an enormous mistake. And, and I think that that's really the, the mistake that scientism makes. It's not at all unreasonable for a musician, let us say, to describe music using all of the apparatus you know, that musical theorists have developed over centuries. These are not scientific descriptions. They're descriptions that are suitable to the task. And they've been honed and developed over centuries so that musicians understand them and they understand what people are talking about when they talk about harmony and when they talk about counterpoint and all these other things. So um, you know, I don't think that you can offer an algorithm for if you follow these steps, you will get reasonable knowledge. I don't think that's how knowledge works. We don't. We don't have algorithms for knowledge. We don't even in science have algorithms for getting knowledge. I mean, that's one of the things that the philosophy of science and, his, and historians of science have realized over the last 50 years is that, we, we, that all the teachings that we have about you know, induction and so on and so forth really don't capture what scientists really do. And I think that's true of the other disciplines too. So it's not a very good answer to that question, but it's the best I can manage. There's a question here. Thank you very much for the talk. Um, my question's in regards to this slide where you had the two worldviews, the secular worldview um, and the Christian worldview. Um, I guess I'd like you to elaborate a little on why you believe that a secular worldview necessarily um, means, I think you used the, the, uh, the phrase radical individualism, um, and also why you know, the secular worldview necessarily you know, precludes the loving relationship with you know, others and some sort of okay. interconnectedness. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for that question. Uh, let me clarify immediately to say that that isn't what I meant to say. Okay? What I said was, I think, I think what I said was, uh, certainly what I meant to say was, uh, that the most widespread view in our society today is the view that I discovered, which is that, that I sort of uh, explained, which is based on scientism and radical individualism. That's not, a, that's not an original statement of mine. It's simply an observation. But you're certainly, you're certainly right to point out that it's not necessary that one would adopt radical individualism as 
and, and be a secularist. I mean, so because obviously, you know, Marxists would argue that they're not radical individualists, and yet they are secularists. Okay, so so clearly there are secular worldviews that are not uh, that are not invested in radical um, uh, individualism. It's just simply an observation. It's simply, simply an observation that, in my view, the predominant uh, characteristic of our age in the West is indeed radical individualism. And, and, and the other side of that, of that uh, coin is, that goes with it very closely is very often scientism. Um, Christianity, um, you know, has, uh, as I said, a different view, um, but I don't wish to say that, um, that there aren't, you know, um, a whole host, a spectrum of other views. There is a spectrum of views on, in the secular side. There's a spectrum of views on the religious side as well. Question down front here. Um, so I'm glad you brought up the spectrum because I know some people uh, describe faith on a spectrum. And um, Richard Dawkins once said uh, that he himself, if zero was full believer and 10 was a full atheist, he'd actually only be about a 9.7, because he said you can never say with 100% certainty anything you don't have concrete proof. Um, so as a man of science, how would you respond to saying with full certainty that you believe in something like religion? You know, I think that um, by those lights, we never know anything perfectly. And I think that that would be, that would be a, a reasonable a position to take, and so you know, if, if Richard Dawkins is 9.7 or 9.8 is is something, uh, then everyone will have their own position on that spectrum. But you know, what you have to do in your life is to take decisions based on incomplete knowledge, on on incomplete understanding. Every day, every moment of our lives, we're making decisions on the basis of incomplete knowledge. Many of those decisions, you know, are trivial and, and unimportant, okay? Um, others of those decisions are life-changing and will determine where we end up. And so I would argue that however complete or incomplete our knowledge is, we are obliged by virtue of being the creatures that we are to make decisions and to act on them. And I would argue that faith is bound up with that necessity to act. So Richard Dawkins actually does act on his 9.7, you know, on a scale of 10 belief. So he goes out and tries to persuade people that he's right, okay? And in a certain sense, that's a consistent position to have, consistent with his beliefs, okay? Um, but I would argue that that is, in a sense, no more principled um, than a Christian who says, I am, you know, I guess we're down the bottom of the scale, are we? We're, we're sort of 0.3% point, point um, uh, <laughs> uncertain, okay? Um, I'm, I'm convinced the other way, and I'm going to act on that conviction. I think that that's another p aspect of what we mean by faith. Faith is acting on your convictions in a consistent way uh, and trying to uh, live out what you believe to be true. And I think that's what religious people do. But it is also, by the way, what secular people do. Let's see. Question back up there. Um, during your talk, you alluded to scientific evidence in support of um, at least the suggestion of a creator. I was wondering if you can elaborate on what, what you were referring to. Um, yeah, very briefly. Um, so I actually think um, that we've just, there, there have of course been many de uh, developments in cosmology and our understanding of the physical world in the last hundred years. I think many of those developments have actually undermined the old objections to uh, uh, cr the Christian faith and to religion generally. For example, once upon a time, let's say in the time of Boyle and of, of Newton, people thought that the world was basically deterministic, that if you knew all the equations uh, that govern the universe and you knew all the, the starting posi positions, the initial conditions, you could just essentially calculate forward and everything would be determined. 
We now know that the world is not like that. Quantum mechanics has told us that the world is not like that. That there is, in fact, genuine uncertainty in the world. Um, and, the, and that the universe is not, as far as we can tell, deterministic. Despite the fact that we've tr attempted, we've done our very best to apply our deterministic understanding, because that's basically the type of understanding that the sciences develop, um, we, we've actually failed and we're back in a position where in the end we know there is, there's real statistics. So that's an example of the fact that um, many of the old, uh, older expectations of natural sciences have not proven to be true and, and the universe seems much more open than it once would have done in, let's say, the 17th or even the 19th century. Another example um, is to do uh, with the, the fact that the universe had a beginning. So the fact, you know, once upon a time, um, it was possible to believe that there was no beginning to the universe. But as far as we know, everything in physical sciences points to the fact that the universe actually did have a beginning. Uh, that's consistent with uh, the Judeo-Christian um, perspective on the world as as a, as, a, as a creature, as, as, a, as a creation. Um, there are many other kinds of examples. I don't want to put these forward as proofs of God. I'm not arguing that they are proofs, but I think they are hints. They're suggestive that actually some of the uh, ways that Christians and, and other religious believers have thought about um, the world make, if anything, more sense today than they did 100, 200 years ago. Good. Well, our time is going to be running short soon. I'm probably only going to be able to take maybe one more question um, here. We could do a couple maybe if we uh, want uh, to extend it a little bit. So, uh, should we get a question here? Hi. Um, in your final slide, you suggest that the best methodology for understanding Christianity is to look at scripture without any presuppositions. Um, in in the subfields of religious studies of hermeneutics, it's suggested that it's impossible to ever read text without making any suppositions to begin with. If that's true, would that call into question the ability to use textual interpretation as a valid form of knowledge generation for religion? Okay, well, I, if I said without any presuppositions, that's of course hopeless. You can't, you can't come to anything without any presuppositions, okay? Mm -hmm. I, didn't, I didn't mean to say that. Um, and I think you're, you're pointing out that, that, it, that one of the, this is actually, of course, an aspect of po the postmodern viewpoint, which is that everyone brings their presuppositions to the table, and, and it's inescapable to do so. But I think, there's a, I think there are actually ways that one can come to texts um, in ways that are at least acknowledging of your own presuppositions and, and opening up the questions about your own presuppositions. Um, so I'm enough of a scientist and, 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 and little of a postmodern to actually believe that there are ways of approaching historic texts that are able to discover plausible um, uh, interpretations of them, inter interpretations that are more plausible than others. So I think, you know, that we in society as a whole have, think there are ways of, of um, approaching questions about historic events that lead to plausible interpretations. This is, uh, this is after all, of, of course, how our legal system works. You know, we have evidence. It's evaluated by, you know, 12 people. Uh, it's presented to them in a certain way, and they're asked to evaluate it. So we have forensic approaches to uh, trying to discover truth and falsehood. No one's going to say it's perfect, um, but I think it's something that one has to do. And, and my own belief is that if you approach the New Testament with an open mind, um, that it, it, it proves to be an amazingly persuasive document. That's my view. Good. Well, let's, let's, uh, that went pretty quickly. Let's take at least one more question. Um, do I see one in the aisle up here? Uh, yes, right here. There's a microphone right beside you. Um, so I have a question, like as a future geologist, and people have questioned things as, such as uh, evolution and just certain sciences, and 
I grew up as a Catholic, and so I was taught certain things, but then growing up, I start to question certain things um, in the Bible, and if it should be taken literally. And I was wondering, how do you deal with that in terms of, because I've, I've met extremists when it comes to Christianity, and how do you not be a selective Christian per se? How do you say, okay, well, this doesn't make sense to me from a scientific perspective, but then still make it clear that you do believe in a God and you still have faith? Okay, thank you. Thank you for that question. So it's about, it's about you know, um, how, how, do we, how do we balance the authorities that we have? It's a question about um, how do we make sense of scriptural authority, for example. Um, one, thing, one place I start is recognizing that if you come to the Bible, as has been pointed out over here, you cannot escape the necessity to do interpretation. Um, that's true of all documents. Um, so there is no such thing as a straightforward reading of any text, so postmodernists would tell us, and I think they're basically right. That doesn't mean that you can't discover what things are, are about, but I think you have to be uh, consistent about them. I think that there, ha there is a, a millennia-long tradition in Christianity of recognizing that if you approach, let's say, the book of Genesis, that um, it's unlikely that a purely literalistic approach to Genesis is actually um, a valid approach to it. Um, even people as long ago as St. Augustine uh, warned Christians uh, about literal interpretation of Genesis. Um, and he, and, and he, his main point was to say that we shouldn't try to cement some kind of our, our interpretation of Genesis in such a way uh, that, it, that it contradicts um, other, other knowledge that we have outside of things. So very, uh, a very interesting character called John Walton, who's a professor of Old Testament uh, at Wheaton College, who was up in um, Boston this week talking about um, some new insights into, the, into understanding Genesis uh, that he brings to the table. So, um, you know, how do I do it? Maybe this is a personal question. You are a little bit pers personal in your question, so I'll give you a little bit of personal. How do I do it? You know, I have um, a lot of expertise in the physical sciences. In the physical sciences, I don't see how to make any sense of what we know in physics without recognizing that the universe and the, the Earth is old, much older than a few thousand years. Um, I think that's, you know, to me, inescapable. Um, and I personally have no problem uh, with uh, evolution as being the predominant mechanism by which uh, the diversity and adaptation of biological species came to be what it is today. And I would say it's another of these examples where there can be a natural or a scientific exp uh, explanation and yet also be explanations at other levels. So. If there is, you know, if, if the, the Earth came to be what it was, you know, by cooling of a nebula around a star and so on and so forth, that may all be true, and it doesn't detract from the fact that, you know, the Earth is the creation of God. So I, I'm willing to say both of those two things is true. And I think that I, I, I am comfortable, I don't have a big problem with that um, being the case for evolution. I think the evidence for common descent um, what people mean by evolution is fraught with great difficulty, okay? Cause, cause, because there is a sense in which e evolution itself becomes a kind of metaphysical principle, practically a worldview. I, I, I don't sign on to that. But I think that common descent uh, has very, very strong evidence and growing evidence from genomics and so forth. Um, and so for those, um, for those Christians who are nervous about evolution, um, you know, we, we're going to have to get we're going to have to get the hang of this somehow, right? Well, thanks to all of you, and thanks to Ian for a very stimulating uh, session. For more information about the Veritas Forum, including additional recordings and a calendar of upcoming events, please visit our website at veritas.org.